Uh, so this afternoon, Daniel and I will be talking about um, Farming Smarter's recent project on precision planters. So the whole project started out with, uh, we've sort of seen farmers start to adapt their row crop planters and move them in, into canola a little bit. So we really wanted to dig into this and have a better understanding of it. Um, these planters, although they, although they can be adapted for canola, they're not really built, they're not really manufactured for a canola environment. So we wanted to really, really understand how they operate in that, um, yeah, in, in canola production. So there's a few things we did want to look at. We wanted to look at the difference between an air drill and a precision planter. We also wanted to look at the difference between row spacings on that planter. And, and this becomes pretty interesting as we think about um, how row spacing affects our inputs. So with a wider row spacing, because the row spaces are wider, we have fewer row spaces, fewer rows across the field, and we have to put a lot more inputs in each of those rows. So a lot higher density of seed and fertilizer in those rows. Whereas with a, a narrower row spacing, there's a lot more rows in the field because those rows are packed closer together. So we really don't have to pack the inputs as much in there. And that's why when we went through the project, we had two main questions we wanted to really take a look at. And that was seeding rates and liquid phosphorus application. And it both kind of fits into this dynamics of the wider and narrower row spacings. So I'm going to start by, by talking about our seeding rate study and then when I'm done, Daniel's going to come in and he's going to share some of the economic work he's done on it and cover the liquid FOSS component of the research project. The planter we used was a monosem vacuum planter. So your air drill usually puts your canola seed into the field by using air pressure. It'll, it'll push those canola seeds through that seed run and into the field. And because the canola seed is so small and so light, they really get jostled around in that run. Um, so what happens is we often get emergence that is spatially quite variable and kind of spotty emergence. And, and this is one of the reasons farmers have been looking at using a planter is to do a better job of planting our canola, of, of using all the seed we put in the ground and getting better emergence. Um, because really what we're getting maybe 40, 50, 60 percent emergence. It's, it's really not as good as, as we'd like to see. So what the monosem does is it uses vacuum pressure and this picture here shows one of the discs that we use. So this disc has a series of holes in it and as that disc runs through the seed, it uses vacuum pressure to suck those canola seeds to those holes. And as that disc rotates, it drops those seeds incrementally one after another, equally distant from each other in the seed row. Here's just another shot of one of those seed discs. And this one shows kind of what happens every once in a while when we get, um, we'll get doubles or skips in that, in that seed disc. Now, I've heard from producers that sometimes there is trouble with this where they end up cleaning out those discs uh, a couple times in a quarter section. But for us, once we kind of got the setting set and made sure we had the debris cleared out of there before we got started, it really wasn't a big issue. So zooming out on this planter, the, the smaller circle there, that's where the seed disc is. So that we've got the, um, the seed is stored above there, it drops into that seed disc, and again, as it rotates around, it incrementally drops those seeds into the seed row. Um, one of the really interesting things about the seeder is the entire thing is, is ground driven. So the speed of the tractor and the RPMs have no bearing on the rate that the seeds come out. And, and the way this is set up is, is with a series of, of sprockets, uh, which, which are circled there. So in order to change that seed rate, we're changing those sprockets or we're changing the, the seed discs, which have greater or fewer holes corresponding to lower and higher seed rates. So there's just a gauge wheel that kind of keeps that thing consistent no matter what's going on. And, and, and we found it to be really effective um, from a seed placement perspective. Now zooming in again, operationally, we, in the front there we have our, um, our fertilizer being disked in, uh, two inches down, it's side banded. Uh, then we have a trash cleaner behind that. The seed come in, comes in behind there on a little seed shelf. And then there's, you can't really see it well in this picture, but there's a little seed firmer that kind of tucks that seed nicely in that row um, to kind of create a nice seed bed for it. And then finally our liquid foss is applied on top of that afterwards. So the research project we did for, for, for both the liquid foss and the seeding rate, we tested three, three things. We tested an air seeder on 10 inch row spacings a planter on 12 inch row spacings, and then a planter again on 20 inch row spacings. And I'll talk about the seeding rate study here first. So we kind of covered a pretty good range between under a pound an acre to as high as six or seven pounds an acre. And um, we really wanted to see 
you know, how that dynamic of different row spacings interacted with the different seating rates. And again, to see the comparison between the air drill and the planters. So one thing we noticed right away is um, we're, always, we're always depth checking. We're always following those planters and the seeders and, and checking to make sure the seed is where it should be, um, it's at the right depth, it's in the nice seed bed, it's not getting blown out of the furrow. And, and with the, uh, so with the air drill, often it takes a while to really find those seeds. They do get kind of blown around. You can find one or two and it might or might not help you find the other ones. But with the monosam, with the precision planter, those seeds were right on. Once we found one or two seeds, we knew exactly where the rest would be. It, it really was incredible how well, you know, that seed placement worked um, equally distant from each other depending on the settings. And, and I should mention that, that with all the gear ratios and the discs, we could hit any seed rate, any fertilizer application rate we wanted within about five or seven percent. So one of the big parts of this story was, was emergence. And as I mentioned before, one of the big questions, one of the big reasons to move towards using planters was disappointment in the, in the performance from an emergence standpoint with the air drill. So the top row that I have there shows our lowest seed rate. And we've got the air drill, the planter on 12s, and the planter on 20s. And if you look at the air drill, that's in the top left corner there, you can see that the emergence there is, it's pretty sporadic. Um, it's not really a nice looking plot. Um, so spat spatially, sort of random, sort of all over the place, the plants are at different stages. Whereas we move over to the planter on 12s and on 20s, um, both those crop stands visually look a lot nicer. And of course the 20s look really nice because again with the w wider row spacing we do have a lot more seeds in there. Uh, the bottom row is our higher seed rate and everything there actually looks pretty nice. But again, for, as far as seed rates are concerned, um, high seed rates are sort of a risk mitigation strategy. So we know there will be attrition with a high seed rate, but often we'll maintain yield. But to go back to the low seed rate, just visually that the air drill doesn't look like it's doing as good a job as the monosem. And we often find that with our own plots. Um, if we go in and look after seeding, we kind of want to wait till those plants are at a, uh, a later stage to really make judgment on how well that plot looks because it takes a while to sort of fill out. But what was really interesting about it was empirically, looking at the numbers, um, quantitatively the emergence was just as good with the air drill as it was with the planter. So this chart, this chart shows our emergence, so percent emergence, the, the percent of seeds that we planted that came up. Um, and I've grouped it, each group of bars is a different seed rate between 20, 40, 60, 80, and 160 seeds per meter squared. So 20 is a little bit under a pound an acre and 160 is about six or seven pounds an acre and the other three are sort of in that two to four, three to five range. So if we look at that, um, okay, so the, the blue is the air drill, uh, the red is the, the planter on 12s, and the green is the planter on 20s. And what's really interesting is on that low seed rate, even though visually it looked like the, the seed drill wasn't doing as good a job, the number of plants is actually better than it was for the planter on 12s and 20s. And it really takes a while. We really have to get up to some of those high seed rates before we start seeing the planter on 12s outperforming the other seeders. So that was something that was really interesting. We, we, we didn't really, visually it looked like there was a big difference, but when we counted, counted the seeds that were up there, the plants that were there, um, there wasn't a really big performance advantage until the high rates um, for the planter, and that was only on the 12 inch row spacings. Another thing to note on this slide is just what the numbers are. So on those low rates, we're kind of all three are around that 60% emergence, really not a number anybody would be too happy about, but sort of what we get. And then the 40, 60, and 80, again, that's about two, two to five pounds an acre. And we're hovering right around that 50% emergence. And, and there's not really a significant um, boost for emergence with the planter yet. But what was really interesting was when we looked at the yield side of things. So this is the same chart, and it's showing yield instead of emergence. And right away, we can see that the planter on the 12-inch rows significantly outperformed both the air drill and the planter on 20s. Now, because we know the emergence was pretty consistent, the, it, it's not a, better num a, a greater number of plants that survived to the end, but it's the plants that were there performed better on the 12-inch row spacing. 
So this was a pretty big deal. We, we, we've conducted this study for two years now, three sites a year. So this is um, six sites of, of actual data and it's showing a significant, a 15 to 20 percent yield boost for the planter on 12 inch rows over an air drill. So we're pretty excited about that. Again, we're sort of halfway through the project, so we're being cautiously optimistic, but we're, yeah, we're really excited about the potential for, for using planters in canola. One of the things that we find uh, as researchers when we design trials is, is we have a bit of an idea what we're gonna discover as we go through the trial. And in this case, we really thought the story was gonna be about the seeding rate. And, and we wanted to see, we expected to see a different optimal seeding rate for each of the seeders, um, for the air drill, the planter on 12s, and the planter on 20s. But, but this chart just shows that even if you focus in on those middle three groups, you know, that, that two to five pounds an acre, um, on the 12 inch row spacing, it, it looks like it hardly matters what seed rate you put down. Um, you get it right around 60 bushels an acre either way. But the row spacing is really the story. That really comes out. So we're really excited about this. This is a, a, an aerial image um, and it just shows a lot of the things that, that I've been talking about. If you look at the bottom left there, um, that's a low seed rate planted with our air drill. And you can see that sort of spotty emergence. It's not uniform. Um, and if you really look closely, there's plants that are in flower and plants that aren't quite in flower yet. So it's not a really nice looking plot. But if we look at the planter, um, so the monostem on both 12s and 20s, it's a lot more uniform. Even at those low rates, we have plots that, that the plant stand looks a lot nicer. So that really highlights one of the differences between the two seeders. The other thing I'd like to point out is the difference between the 12s and 20s for the planter. And if you look at the 20s, right away you can see the gaps between the rows. And that speaks to one of the reasons we think the, the 20 inch row spacings aren't performing as well as the 12s, is, is we do have that gap. We do have that sunlight. We're not getting that, that, um, that full canopy closure as soon with the 20 inch row spacings because they're wider. So we're not taking as good advantage of the solar resources as we could be or as good, we're not taking advantage of the resources in the soil um, as well as we could be either. So the monosem does a really good job of allotting seeds a certain area of resources. So I, I'm a bit of a, my background is geography. I'm sort of a spatial pattern kind of guy. And as I was thinking through this, I, I sort of wanted to diagram how I was thinking about this. And, and on the left, we have the air drill, and you can see what the seed pattern sort of looks like there. It's pretty sporadic. Uh, some seeds are on their own, then they have lots of resources, lots of space to grow. Some of them are clustered, and you'll see some attrition there. If we move over to the 20s, you can see that wider row spacing and a lot more inputs in each row. And because of that, those seeds are pretty close together. And because they're so densely packed together, it doesn't take very long before they start competing with each other for resources. Whereas on the 12 inch row spacing, again, narrower rows, so they're a little closer together, a little bit fewer inputs in the rows, and each seed has a lot more space to grow before it starts competing with other seeds for resources, whether that's in the soil or whether that's solar resources, solar energy. So I think, I think if we're gonna develop another seeder, the next seeder down the line, we, we do spend a lot of time um, trying to optimize seed production, um, the idea of seed bed utility. And I think that's really important and it's, it's a big part of how we plant things. But we don't really think about the placement of the seed. And, and this study sort of shows us that might, that, that might be a big part of the story moving forward. So this here is, it's sort of based on a hexagonal pattern. And what it does is it would place seeds so that they're all equally distant from one another, that each seed has the exact amount, can maximize, um, can grow as much as possible before it starts competing with other seeds for resources. And, and this might be the direction to go uh, for future seeders. Um, and you'll notice it's, it's pretty similar to the monosem on the 12 inch row spacing, just a staggered start. And, and to really put this into practice, we'd have to go even narrower, but kind of an interesting idea for the future. And, and this, this prospective seeder would optimize access to resources for all the seeds. It would focus on prime placement for all the seeds. And of course it would be robotic. So I'm suggesting we call it Optimus Prime. Uh, with that, I think I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Daniel.
Okay, so I'm going to follow with a bit of economics on the seeding rate uh, trial. So this slide just illustrates the net return uh, per acre by the different seeding rates. So when we're talking net return, what we're doing is we're basically doing a, a basic economic analysis and taking the costs associated with this project and seeing how the cost, uh, especially focusing on the seeding rate, how the cost uh, increases as you increase the seeding rate. Um, so the 12 inch planter and the nine and a half inch uh, air drill, you kind of see a similar curve uh, where at that 3.3 pounds an acre is kind of where you're seeing your optimal net return per acre. And at that high rate of seeding, you're actually seeing more of a, a decrease. And part of that is just because it's doubling the seeding rate, your costs are obviously gonna go up quite a bit. Uh, and then something else um, with this graph that with the 20 inch planter, something that we've kind of been saying the whole time, and I'll continue to say, is there's not a lot of positives coming out of the 20 inch row planter for canola. The spacing is quite wide. There's a lot of seeds in there and it, it looks like it's just not performing as well as it's, it should be or could, could be compared to the other row spacings. Um, so now I'll move on to the liquid FOSS study. So again, it's basically a tale of these two planters um, trying to figure out which row spacing or which implement has more potential or what, what's going to come out of this trial. So with this study, um, we started with five uh, phosphorus rates applied at seeding. Uh, so that was 0, 5, 10, 20, and 40 of actual P applied at seeding. So we were a little concerned with the high rates of P and how that would affect the seed and what damage there would be. Uh, and after the first year, we actually didn't notice any damage with that high rate of P at 40 kilograms of actual P um, per hectare. So we increased it to 60 kilograms this year. And that is when we started to see some actual um, changes and some results from that high rate of phosphorus. <clears throat> so this, this seed place, place liquid FOSS study also had an economic uh, portion. So like the uh, seeding rate study, what we did is we focused on the cost of the phosphorus and got a total cost depending on the amount applied at seeding and got a total phosphorus cost and subtracted that from the total price we obtained from the yield of canola. And so we had a, a selling price of canola around $11.5 a bushel. And we're hoping that these results can mirror the results that you can achieve with your operation or that they can kind of give you some ideas of what, where we're at and maybe some adjustments that you could possibly do. And as well as the seeding rate study, this liquid FOSS also really mirrors what we've seen in the seeding rate trial where the 12 inch planter is showing a lot of potential and a lot of um, growth for canola. So first I'll just talk about some emergence. Um, so in this, in this slide, as this may speak for itself, the biggest thing to note is we are seeing a lot of damage in emergence with that high phosphorus rate. For all three different spacings, there's a lot of damage and a lot lower emergence on that 60 kilograms. Uh, still, the 12-inch planter has the highest emergence compared to the other two row spacings. Um, and that, that air drill actually really doesn't change much. As you increase the phosphorus rate, there isn't a whole lot of fluctuation uh, in the emergence. And again, same thing we've been saying before, the 20 inch planter, it starts lower and it, it ends quite a bit lower than the other options as well. Uh, so now I'll just talk about some yield and how the phosphorus rates affected our yield. Um, so similar curves with the 9.5 and the 12 inch planter. Um, with the 12 inch planter, it's basically an incremental yield response to the increase in phosphorus rate. Uh, the air drill actually has a smaller curve and there isn't much difference as well on that increase of FOSS. And then the same thing with that uh, 20 inch planter where we're not seeing a lot of uh, potential, a lot of benefit in using that row spacing. It starts quite a bit lower and again, there's a decline that 60 kilograms an hectare where um, there is some damage. There's a lot of seeds in that row and that phosphorus is actually just hurting the seed more than anything else. So basically the purpose of these two trials is to understand what the benefits are of these two different seeders or what the benefits of are, are of these two different row spacings. Um, they both have positives, they both have negatives, and so we're just trying to understand 
how these different seizures can help you or benefit you in your operation. Um, so this, this slide is a pretty good visual of everything that we learned in this study. Uh, and again, our concern was with that high phosphorus rates, we would see some damage to the canola. And this, this illustrates that that's not necessarily the case. So focusing on the dry land, you can see that as you increase the uh, canola, or as the phosphorus rate, the yield doesn't change that much. At that 60 kilograms, you're seeing a bit of a decrease, but when we look further into that, the 9.5 the and the 12 inch row spacings, there really isn't much damage at that higher rate of FOSS. It's really the 20 inch planter where we're seeing the biggest uh, downfall and the biggest decrease, both in emergence and in yield, there's a lot of um, negative response to that high phosphorus rate. And then when we look at the irrigation, um, looks more like as you increase the FOSS, the yield also goes up, where that highest phosphorus rate actually produces the highest yield. So again, we look a bit further into that and what row spacing or what implement kind of shows the best response. So with the air drill, we actually found that the lower rates uh, typically produce the higher yields. And then on the air drill, as you increase FOSS, so the yield does follow. And then again, the 20 inch planter, that's where we're seeing the damage at that high phosphorus rates. And it's almost as if that, um, that spacing is just too, too wide and there's too many seeds in that row spacing for uh, that phosphorus rate. So just some final thoughts about this project. Um, so we have one year left. Uh, we're fairly excited about the potential for these precision planters, what they can do, and how they can be adapted for Southern Alberta, both for different kinds of crops and also for a no-till seeding environment. Uh, we're seeing that uh, you can reduce seeding rates in canolas with planters. Uh, higher yields are also possible with narrow row planters, and that higher yields uh, may require more phosphorus, especially on irrigated land. Um, so yeah, just in conclusion, um, we're excited about what we've seen so far, and we're looking forward to how we can see uh, planters push canola yields. Thank you. All right, uh, time now to uh, check in on any questions. Uh, I'm sure many of you have got canola out there. Are you thinking of making the move to planters uh, as opposed to the traditional seeders? Any questions for our crew? So economics wise, are the planters a lot more expensive? Like did that factor into your economic uh, calculations at all in terms of um, you know, the affordability of making that move? So we didn't look a lot into the cost of the planters because when these planters are made, they're typically designed um, based on your operation or your preferences. So in our economic analysis, we didn't include the cost of the planter, but that would definitely change your results because you cannot use a planter for all your crops. Um, but that would definitely affect it because I, yeah, it's a, it's a more specialty planter as of now. Did it take some modifications to the traditional planters to make it work for canola? One of the things we found uh, with the with the monosem planter that it wasn't really um, as well adapted to a zero till environment as we might have liked, and and we did see this a lot in the corn, uh, trying to manage different stubble or when we were seeding into areas where there was compaction. Um, in those in those circumstances, the air seeder did do a. a a better job of sort of getting the crops up and getting them emerged. Um, but since we started this project, we've seen that some of the manufacturers are already taking steps to address these things. So it's not a, a big thing, but, but we think there's probably some work to be done to better adapt planters to operation in a zero-till environment. Great, okay, and uh, I imagine your research, is it being uh, shared on Farming Smarter's website? Oh, yeah, so you can check on it there. Uh, one last call, any questions? Oh, we got one at the back. Go ahead. Well, 
Well, for, for, our, for our plot seeder, now what we do is we measure out the exact number of seeds that we need for that plot. Um, so we, we know, I don't know if you're asking about the, the rate that's going down, but we know we're hitting those rates because we, we measure that out in an envelope and let it, let it go through, through, through the plot, so. Yeah, yeah. That, that could be, that could be. Um, like we spend a lot of time, like for our air seeder, and, and it may, maybe it's a little bit different for a, for a field scale um, piece of equipment, but for ours, we do spend a lot of time making sure we get those calibrations as well, so that we test the, the meters on the different, the high setting, the low setting, and everything, so we know everything's coming out within 10% of, of the seed rate we're, we're aiming for, so. Great, okay, well thank you very much, uh, Lewis and Daniel. Uh, not easy to follow our, our enthusiastic 4-H'ers, but you did a great job, thank you so much.